Hello to everyone. I am Jessica Goldstein, Education Program Coordinator at ASRM. Welcome to this webinar on rare ectopic pregnancies. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Zach Knight, and today's moderator, Kurt Barnhart. Before we begin, please note, this webinar was developed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and the Society for Reproductive Surgeons as an educational resource and service to its members and other reproductive professionals. While this webinar reflects the views of the panelists, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to dictate an exclusive course of treatment. Members should always use their best judgment in determining a course of action and be guided by the needs of the individual patient, available resources, and institutional or clinical practice limitations. All attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type a question into the question chat window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for notification. Our moderator, Dr. Barnhart, is a tenured professor in the Department of OBGYN and a senior scholar at, in the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Penn School of Medicine. He currently serves as the Director of Women's Health Clinical Research Center and is Vice Chair for Clinical Research at Penn School of Medicine. Dr. Barnhart has 22 years of continuous NIH-supported research and has been involved in more than 60 clinical trials, translational research, and outcome studies in women's health. Dr. Barnhart serves as the District, District 3 Secretary for the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and is a member of the ASRM Research Task Force. Dr. Barnhart is the Video and New Media Editor for Fertility and Sterility, ASRM's flagship journal. We are delighted to have him. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Barnhart to introduce today's speakers. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us at this, um, I think, exciting webinar. Um, this uh, webinar is uh, going to talk about emerging topics and, and rare topic pregnancies. Uh, ectopic pregnancy, the diagnosis and treatment is still a vexing problem for all of us and, and frankly, just all too common. Well, we're not going to go over all diagnostic and treatment methodology at this point. I think we're going to mo focus more on the exciting ones, the fascinating ones, and the entertaining ones, because we're going to talk about the unusual ectopic pregnancies and a surgical approach to, to them. Um, these rare ectopic pregnancies and how we treat them are often debated and discussed at grand rounds, at mortality, uh, at M&M &M conferences. And today we're gonna to have a seminar that's gonna help you be the most up to date so you can join in those discussions at your institution, but more importantly, um, to better take care of your patients. To um, educate you, I have two very distinguished um, professors and surgeons. I have Togas Tulundi, who is the professor and chair of obstetrics and gynecology at the Milton Leong, I'm sorry, the Milton Leong Chair in Reproductive Medicine at McGill University and chief of the department of obstetrics and gynecology. I also have Sirak Khan, who is a um, division chair of reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, he has an appointment in the division of minimal invasive gynecologic surgery and specializes in advanced reproductive surgery, including fibroids, malaria anomalies, and complex advanced endometriosis. But more to the point for today is going to be that rare and exciting ectopic pregnancy. I'm going to have Dr. Khan start us off, and he's going to go into his presentation, followed by Dr. Um, Tulundi, and then we'll have a question and answer period. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Dr. Barnard, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to the ASRM and the SRS for arranging such, such an exciting webinar, and welcome, everybody. Um, today, I will be um, covering a, a certain select group of these, those rare ectopic pregnancies, and then my colleague, uh, Dr. Talandi, will be covering the remaining. Um, just a quick dis disclosure, uh, nothing to disclose for this presentation. Um, and as mentioned today, I will be covering cervical ectopic pregnancies, rudimentary horn pregnancies, as well as ovarian ectopics. While as my colleague will be covering cesarean section scar, ectopic pregnancies, as well as interstitial pregnancies. So moving on to cervical ectopics, 
Uh, they're extremely rare forms of ectopic pregnancies and less than 1%, so in one in about 9,000 pregnancies. Um, they're higher risk after the, use of AR, after the use of ART, and early identification is paramount for prevention of major blood loss and subsequent hysterectomy. Now, when talked about the cause of a cervical ectopic pregnancy is typically unknown, but risk factors include previous history of a, a curatage of the endocervical canal, and the use of ART, uh, in which there is a rapid tra uh, transit of the embryo through the endometrial cavity in an otherwise unreceptive endometrium that ends up implanting in the cervical and endo endocervical canal. With presentation, they mostly present with painless, heavy bleeding, but about a third of them can have some form of abdominal pain as well. Now, for physical examination, um, you know, one has to be careful in doing a, a, a bimanual examination, and the recommendation is typically a, a speculum exam first because one could cause harm or cause more bleeding or even rupture an ectopic pregnancy with an aggressive bimanual examination. For transvaginal sonography, uh, typically there's no evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy and a classic hourglass-shaped uterus, which I will show pictures of coming up, and uh, one can usually visualize the entire endometrial strike without any evidence of a gestational sac. Now, it is important to distinguish uh, between an, a, a cervical ectopic pregnancy and an incomplete miscarriage. And there are several signs and symptoms or features one can look at or look for on an ultrasound. The gestational sac tends to be uh, regular and have uh, regular contours for a cervical ectopic whereas it's fairly irregular or even teardrop drop shape with uh, incomplete miscarriages. The gestational sac usually has an echo, uh, echogenic rim for cervical ectopics. Um, and for cervical uh, pregnancies, there's usually a negative sliding sign, which is there's no movement of the intracervical sac when vaginal transducer is used gently to apply pressure on the cervix. Typically, in a cervical ectopic pregnancy, the cervical os will be closed, whereas in an incomplete miscarriage, uh, that would be uh, some, uh, mostly open. So those are some important uh, distinguishing features between the two. And other imaging te uh, techniques that can be used for identification is an MRI as well. Here we can see um, a, a sagittal view of a, of, a, of a vaginal ultrasound with a cervical ectopic pregnancy that is below the level of the internal os. And this is that classic hourglass shaped um, uterus that can be seen on an MRI in this image with the ectopic pregnancy in the cervix. Now, another ultrasound of a patient that I recently saw, we could see a cervical um, a canal here, body of the cervix, and the clear um, gestational sac with regular contours and a yolk sac within the cervix with a sagittal view of the uterus. And again, another patient with a fairly large blood clot in the endometrial cavity, a cervical canal, and a pregnancy clearly in the um, uh, body of the cervix here. Now, typically, ectopic pregnancies will be cervical ectopic pregnancies are managed with um, uh, ideally with ultrasound guided needle um, injection of methotrexate into the gestational sac. Here's a, a quick video um, describing that. Um, let's see. I think I've lost control. So. I am unable to play the video here. Okay, um, I'll go back. So I'm sorry about that. Let's go back to the slide back. Let's go to the first video slide. Even the one before that, there you go. Okay, so one next and let's play this video. So here on transvaginal ultrasound scanning through the lower uterine segment and cervix, the pregnancy was confirmed uh, to be within the cervical canal um, and an irregular gestational sac in this uh, uh, ultrasound could be seen with a yolk sac and a fetal pole visualized. Next slide. And let's play that video. Using a, trans a transvaginal ultrasound uh, with a needle guide, uh, an 18 uh, gauge Chiba needle was um, guided into the gestational sac and the contents were aspirated as shown here. Next slide. The aspiration needle was removed, um, and from the knee, uh, so and the needle, the the inner cap uh, needle was removed, and the needle was left in the sac where methotrexate was then injected into the gestational sac, as can be seen here. Next slide. And then finally, this area was observed for five minutes, 
Um, the gestational sac is collapsed. Um, it measures about one by one centimeter. Uh, the patient remains stable without any evidence of ble ongoing bleeding. And postoperatively, she also received system systemic methotrexate, and that resulted in complete resolution of this cervical ectopic. So really, when we talk about management, there's no established criteria for medical versus surgical management. Uh, but it, it personally, I, it, you know, with cervical ectopic pregnancies, they're fairly high risk, and we tend to um, talk to patients about um, ultrathion guided needle um, aspiration of the sac with injection of methotrexate. Methotrexate is the first line treatment, um, and there are different dose regimens that could be used. But in my opinion, for the cervical ectopics and for the especially the advanced ones like rudimentary, as we will go over, um, if methotrexate is used, um, one could use the multi dose regimen or the high dose with Mukaburin Rescue. Uh, with advanced gestations, as the one as the patient seen here, uh, with cardiac activity, intrasac injection of methotrexate or potassium chloride is recommended. Um, and there's limited data to prove the efficacy of one approach versus the other due to the rarity of the condition. Now, continued bleeding post methotrexate can be problematic with patients with cervical ectopic pregnancies. And the recommended approach then is um, an endocervical curatage, but there's a very high risk of blood loss there. Um, and in my opinion, the patient should definitely be consented for a hysterectomy um, if one ends up in that situation. Um, but in our institution, we heavily rely on our interventional radiology colleagues as well and um, use uterine artery embolization in those settings as well, which can reduce the risk of hysterectomy. Obviously, for uncontrolled bleeding in cases of cervical ectopic pregnancies, hysterectomy would be the first route right, um, in moving forward. Moving on to rudimentary horn pregnancies. Um, rudimentary horn pregnancies are also extremely rare with an incidence of about one pregnancy in every 76 to 150,000 pregnancies. When we talk about rudimentary horns, um, typically we say that a unicorn uterus, about 75% of them would have some form of a, a rudimentary horn present. And the nomenclature can be seen here. I'll show it in a pictorial form very soon. But really, um, it's a type A or B, and then A is divided to A1A, A1B, and A2. And A1A really is a unicorn uterus with communication to the rudimentary horn with active endometrium. A1B is a unicorn uterus without communication to the rudimentary horn that has active endometrium. And A2 is a unicorn uterus without, uh, with a rudimentary horn without active endometrium, while the type B is just a unicorn uterus with no rudimentary horn. ASRM classification can be seen here. And these are the group of pregnancies, uh, or uh, these are the malarian anomalies that we're talking about, the rudimentary horn communicating with active endometrium, non-communicating with active endometrium, and then finally, uh, without any active endometrium. And again, just to show the various types that we were talking about here in a picture or cartoon form. So usually, um, a rudimentary horn ectopic pregnancies would occur in uh, patients that have active endometrium in the rudimentary horn, whether it is communicating or non-communicating. Uh, for the non-communicating ones, the, uh, the thought process is that the, sper the sperm actually swims up the unicorn uterus, out the fallopian tube, and then onto uh, fertilizing the egg, which is picked up by the fallopian tube of the rudimentary horn. Usually these patients will present, will be asymptomatic in the first trimester, um, and a lot of them, or most of them, will present with actually acute abdominal pain with or without signs of hypovolemic shock, uh, typically after the rupture of, uh, or typically after rupture of the horn in the mid trimester, the average is of 21 to 23 weeks of gestation. So early diagnosis is a crucial step for rudimentary horn ectopic pregnancies. Uh, and there's some ultrasound criteria. Uh, one is a false pattern of an asymmetrical uh, uterus that could give an illusion of a bicornuate uterus. The second one is an absent continuity of tissue surrounding the gestational sac, and it's not in line with the uterine cervix. Um, and the pregnancy is actually has to be surrounded by myometrial tissue um, in its entirety. So here we see uh, some ultrasound pictures of a sagittal view of a uterus with decidualized endometrium complete continuity from the fundus all the way to the um, uh, external os. But as we go into an axial section, we can see the uterus here, this uh, slight communication with a, with a rudimentary horn and a gestational sac within the rudimentary horn on the right side. 
This is another patient that we recently saw at 13 weeks, presented with acute bleeding um, and a recurrent uh, rudimentary horn ectopic pregnancy. Unfortunately, her horn was not removed at an outside institution after her first ectopic. And um, the first thing we saw on ultrasound was a advance in gestation with sur surrounded by myometrium. However, as we scanned along in the sagittal section, we actually saw a normal appearing uterus with an empty um, um, uh, endometrial cavity. And on axial section, we again saw the rudimentary horn with a pregnancy inside with uh, a tissue connecting to the actual uterus. So really for management, these are very high risk ectopic pregnancies with high risk of uterine rupture and or placental abnormalities if they're not caught in time without rupture. Um, medical management, um, in my, I have not done any medical management in my experience as I've only encountered these pregnancies in the setting of an acute abdomen. Um, but there is reports on medical management with methotrexate if early. Um, there is caution because most of these patients with unicornial uteri, uteri could have a single kidney, making sure that there's adequate renal function before giving methotrexate. And then also, uh, I think it, it's, a, it's worth ta debating uh, whether one should be more aggressive with methotrexate uh, and do a multi-dose regimen or a high dose with leucoverin rescue for these high-risk ectopic pregnancies. Um, and typically, most will present later and will require surgical excision, as we've seen in, in the previous um, images. Um, and another point that's commonly discussed is what do we do when we incidentally find a rudimentary horn? Um, and in my opinion, the one I, rudimentary horns with an active endometrium, whether they're communicating or not, um, should be removed to reduce the, the subsequent risk of an ectopic pregnancy, whereas rudimentary horns that are um, a type 1B without any active endometrium could be left in place. Here are some uh, intraoperative pictures of that advanced gestational ultrasound that I showed you with 13 weeks. And you can see here there's a rudimentary horn on the right side with a uterovarian ligament and the ovary on the right side, the fallopian tube, and the normal unicornial uterus on the left side. Um, here we are, are starting to approach the pregnancy with performing a salpingectomy first. We can see the right ovary. And then ultimately with removal of the entire horn, we can see the final picture here with the right ovary in place, the unicornial uterus on the left side, and the entire rudimentary horn with the ectopic pregnancy excised in this case. Here's another um, uh, quick video of a patient that presented with a key, uh, uh, an acute abdomen. And here we can see a rudimentary horn with some uh, bleeding at the end with a small rupture. Here we're starting to perform a salpingectomy with a ligature device. Um, the right ovary can be seen down here with a normal appearing left unicornial uterus. I typically approach um, the rudimentary horns just as one would do a salpingectomy. Um, usually we would open the retroperitoneum to identify the ureter, but this patient had a very low BMI with a ureter that can be seen um, probably in this video later, but you will see it's uh, uh, way, way down um, and we were working higher up. Here we can see probably the ureter we'll see in a little bit. But we're using a ligature device to come across the uh, rudimentary horn and then finally coming anterior to it, um, making sure that there's meticulous hemostasis along the way towards the end, and then finally grabbing a larger ligature device to clamp across the rudimentary horn that contains the ectopic pregnancy. Once that's completed, um, suction irrigation of the pelvis is performed um, to make sure there's adequate hemostasis. I'll get this video a little faster here, just to show you the end. An endo bag was used to ex remove the ectopic pregnancy. And I'll sometimes use um, laparoscopic sutures here uh, to close that. We can see the ureter was way down below and tracked it down all the way down. Um, and then that was the final result with excision of the rudimentary horn uh, with final hemostasis. Um, and finally, for ovarian ectopic pregnancies, the incidence of ovarian ectopic is uh, low as well, one in 2,000 to 60,000 pregnancies, and they account for about 3% of all the ectopic pregnancies. Uh, the biggest risk factor for ovarian ectopics actually is the use of an IUD, um, and one in nine uh, ovarian pregnancies um, have uh, an IUD in place. 
And it's very difficult to make the diagnosis. I think that's the most challenging part for um, an ovarian ectopic pregnancy. Uh, there's some ultrasound features and then also some intraoperative and histopathologic diagnosing uh, or criteria. So ultrasound features show a white echogenic ring with internal echolucent area on an ovarian surface. Um, there's actually presence of an ovarian cortex surrounding, the, including corpus luteum and other follicles around the mass. Um, and the echogenicity of the ring is higher than the ovary itself. Um, and some intraoperative and histologic criteria, um, it, one has to have an intact fallopian tube uh, on the affected side. The fetal sac must be on the same side as the ultrasound had determined, and the ovary should be connected to the uterovarian ligament to uh, make sure that that's the ovary. And then finally, on histopathology, the gestational sac should be um, surrounded by ovarian tissue in order to make that diagnosis. Uh, for the management of ovarian pregnancy, again, very limited data, uh, but there is efficacy of methotrexate for earlier pregnancies and then ovarian wedge resection uh, for earlier ovarian pregnancies or um, if not, uh, an ophorectomy for advanced cases um, usually is the management for ovarian ectopic pregnancies. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can save some questions until later, so we'll go on to Dr. Um, Tulundi's presentation. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Barnhart, and also Dr. Goodman and the uh, ASRM and SRS for inviting me here. So I was asked to give a talk on surgical treatment of cesarean scar pregnancy and interstitial pregnancy. Uh, I think, uh, here we go. Uh, I don't have anything to disclose regarding this presentation, except I'm a, a contributor for up to date, and we have a whole bunch of articles on ectopic pregnancy and up to date. Cesarean scar pregnancy. The incidence is about one in 2000 pregnancies and six per 100 ectopic pregnancies after cesarean deliveries. Interestingly, it is independent on the number of cesareans. There are two types of cesarean scar pregnancy. Type 1 or endogenous type is cesarean scar pregnancy with progression into the uterine cavity to the cervical isthmic space. Now you can see it on the right hand side, this one, this is type one. And it has a high risk of bleeding at delivery. So it can grow all the way to term, but after the delivery, you might have placenta preta and it causes bleeding at delivery. Type two, it's growing outward. So, progression towards the bladder, the bladder is right here, and abdominal cavity. It could be complicated with uterine rupture and bleeding in early pregnancy. You can see here, I'll show you later on, a lot of vessels right there. So there are type one and type two, cesarean scar pregnancy. The diagnosis is ultrasound. To locate the pregnancy, the type of cesarean scar pregnancy and is relationship to the bladder. This is the cesarean scar pregnancy. MRI can delineate the exact location of cesarean scar pregnancy and its relation with surrounding organs. You don't really have to do it, but it's nice to see that this is the cesarean scar pregnancy. The criteria of diagnostic, of course, is positive pregnancy test, empty uterus, and closed cervix. It's right there. The gestation is the prox in the proximity of cesarean scar. You can see it on the lateral uh, image. Absent of thin wall between the myomate. Uh, or thin myometal layer between the gestation and the bladder wall. This is the bladder, it's thin. 
If you do Doppler, you can see abundant blood flow around the gestational sac. Differential diagnosis is cervical pregnancy, as Dr. Khan mentioned, and miscarriage in progress. If you do the sound with the so-called sliding technique, uh, in miscarriage, you can see that product conception moves in cervical pregnancy and also in uh, cesarean scar pregnancy, it does not move. One thing which is uh, important to remember is low anteriorly located gestation in a patient with a previous cesarean scar, previous cesarean delivery is almost always cesarean scar pregnancy. So low anterior located gestation. Somebody had cesarean, almost always cesarean scar pregnancy. Treatment, there are a whole bunch of uh, ways to treat uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Uh, again, depends on the type. Uh, of course, type one, we can remove it from below. Type two, if you do surgery, we have to remove it by laparoscopy or laparotomy. Some people have used med um, medical treatment for cesarean scar pregnancy, especially type two. Um, I prefer to use multi-dose, which is one milligram per kilogram body weight, uh, and alternating with folinic acid. I think it's important to do, you want to treat it really well, so multi-dose and follow the patient very carefully. Some people uh, will do local treatment, inject methotrexate and or KCL like in cervical pregnancy as Dr. Khan mentioned. What is my, oh, it's frozen. Here we go. Surgical treatment for type one, which is the endogenous, endo, endos, endogenous type. Uh, you can do DMC, but you have to do it under ultrasound guidance. It has been described, uh, people perforated the uterus and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. So we have to do it carefully. So just not just do a DNC, but do with ultrasound guidance. Some people will do hysteroscopy. I think it's maybe it's a better control. Um, hysteroscopy with, with loop electrode and remove the pregnancy. If patient bleed, if patient bleeds, uh, we can put a balloon tamponade inside. This is for type one. For type two, which is growing inside the abdominal cavity, um, some people will do vaginal approach, especially the Chinese group. They are more comfortable with vaginal surgery than laparoscopy. Uh, but I prefer to do it by laparoscopy. I think we can see it more by laparoscopy. A juvenile treatment is uterine artery embolization. You might, you might not have to do it right away, but at least if you think she might bleed, you can put the catheter inside just in case she bleeds, then you can embolize it if needed. The best result is combination treatment. My, combi my combination treatment is usually methotrexate, multi-dose, and then if needed, we do surgery. Oops. Now, this is a, a video of cesarean scar pregnancy. I asked uh, one of my uh, an observer from China, and he did a good job, and he edited it. And in fact, he put music, uh, Chinese music. I won't, I won't let you hear it though. Uh, and also put characters here, which I don't understand. But certainly, uh, we can show the procedure. Now they have a lot of cesarean scar pregnancy, despite one. Uh, baby rule. So only one pregnancy allowed. I think they, they are allowed to have two now. Even then, they have a lot of cesarean scar pregnancy. If you see three, they might have see they, they might have seen a hundred patients. So this is uh, the type two, and you can see the big uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Maybe I'll speed it up a bit. So this is just dissecting the cesarean scar 
pushing the bladder down later on and oh sorry for some reason it uh, disappeared i think we are here so uh so we can start seeing that the pregnancy is really big there you go now that's a huge she said it's called pregnancy if it ruptures she will bleed and really bleeding so this is dissection and just carry on dissection and then we can open up this uh pregnancy drain the uh remove the product conception usually i use the suction irrigator to flush out the pregnancy rather than remove it rather than removing it uh, piecemeal by removing it piece, piecemeal you might leave uh, some tissue here this is just to show you how big that pregnancy is and then we, we open up and then we can just uh, close up that uh, incision and uterine wall properly and usually I put the uh, interseed or some other addition barrier. So I, I think I will I will just stop it here for the sake of time. So that's the pregnancy. Now, Dr. Le, who is an observer from China, uh, spent a year with me, and he had three hundred more than three hundred cesarean score pregnancies, and he brought his database to us, and then we did we wrote the paper. And this is uh, published, can't remember where, I think it's uh, J. Make. Uh, what he did is he, he did a couple of uh, treatments. This is DNC under ultrasound guidance. This is DNC and then hysteroscopy. So DNC and hysteroscopy, I don't recommend that again. I think we do hysteroscopy, we put the loop in and we remove it rather than doing DNC. Vaginal surgery, uh, laparotomy, and laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is only 19 patients. Uh, they did more vaginal surgery. This is the residual endometrium, the, end, the sorry, myometrium, uh, the outside of the gestation. It's pretty almost the same, except here by the one by laparoscopy is pretty thin, 1.6, and here all the way to 3.8. The, in the results, and now this is not randomized studies, this is just this is just an observational study, retrospective study. The success rate is pretty good in all of them. Now, of course, we cannot compare, but it's just pretty good, just showing it's pretty good. Again, the beta ACG drop nicely after all the surgery. Of course, if you do uh, laparoscopy, laparotomy, vaginal, it's, it should go down faster, just DNC or hysteroscopy because you might have left some tissue there. So conclusion of Cisan called pregnancy. Again, I just want to tell you, low anteriorly located gestation in a patient with a previous Cisarian score, such as Cisarian delivery is almost always a Cisarian score pregnancy. There are two types. Type 1, uh, in the middle one, can be treated with simply DNC under ultrasound or hysteroscopy. Here, methotrexate might not need it. We can just remove it uh, from below. Type 2, uh, like this one, this is after removal of the gestation, is best treated by laparoscopy. When repair can also be done rather than methotrexate. But we gave methotrexate anyway, before. So again here, the best treatment is combination treatment. So that's all about cesarean score pregnancy. I will just go very quickly about interstitial pregnancy. Uh, I think you, you see more interstitial pregnancy than cesarean score pregnancy. Uh, the incidence is 2-3% of all ectopic pregnancies, rupture in 20 to 50% of cases, death in 2% of all cases. The treatment here, you can give 
methotrexate. Again, uh, I like to give a uh, multi-dose because it, the risk of rupture is high. But we can also inject methotrexate, KCL, or surgical treatment. Surgical treatment could be corneostomy. I'll show you the picture, resection. And some people do hysteroscopic resection. I'm not sure that that, that is uh, entirely interstitial pregnancy, the one they did hysteroscopy resection. One thing which is very important is the possibility of uterine rupture after corneal resection in subsequent pregnancy is three of 10 patients. So it's pretty high. So after corneal resection, if the patient is pregnant, we have to warn the obstetrician, beware that she might rupture. Now this is um, corneal stomy on the right hand side. So basically you do it like you do an ectopic pregnancy, you make uh, an incision like this, um, enough until you can see the product conception. Again, I'm using suction irrigator and flush out the, the the, the gestation rather than removing it piecemeal. We can also do corneal resection. Uh, certainly corneal resection is um, a bit more uh, radical than just corneal stomy. And thinking that this could be better than the other one, turn out that in su the success rate in terms of su future pregnancy and repeat ectopic is the same. The only thing is uh, the data shows that if you do corneal resection, there is a risk of rupture in subsequent pregnancy. Uh, I think that's it. This is just to show you my uh, group at McGill. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We'll now open the floor to questions for our panelists. Please send in your questions through the question chat box located in the gray toolbar to the right or bottom of your screen. Hello, everybody. Um, that was a wonderful presentation by both of you. Very much appreciate it. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, these are rare enough that you really need people with uh, extreme expertise to help you make these, some of these clinical decisions. While I'm waiting for some questions from the audience, which I, I hope that you'll um, type in, let me ask some questions to the panelists as well. Um, Dr. Khan, you mentioned that uh, you use um, local injection of methotrexate. I've heard discussed that methotrexate can be caustic and it's best not to have it locally injected for the damage it might be able to do, or is that an advantage? Um, so is, I guess what I'm asking is, what are the advantages for local injection as opposed to systemic in, injection? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. The way I think about the uh, local injection of methotrexate is I think that I always think about that in high-risk ectopic pregnancies where the complications could be devastating. Um, ones that come to mind are cervical ectopic pregnancies and advanced cesarean section ectopic pregnancies. Um, there's a fine, I, you know, doing systemic methotrexate could be could be considered, but it, in those scenarios, I would definitely consider doing the high dose methotrexate at one milligram per kilogram dose with the Lucoverne Rescue Regimen rather than the one or the two dose regimen. Um, but with, in my personal practice, if there's a cesarean ectopic, I mean ect uh, cervical ectopic. We almost always try to see if uh, we can offer a local um, aspiration and injection of methotrexate over systemic since the complications could be devastating. Have you, either of you seen any complications of local methotrexate? Is there a local effect that is untoward? I'm, I understand methotrexate is trying to inhibit DNA synthesis for the trophoblast, but it, does it have a local effect as well? I haven't seen it, uh, Kurt. And I, ha I have not too. Uh, we've now, we actually um, compiled the list of local injections that we've done in between, uh, where, which included heterotopics, cervical ectopics, and cesarean section scar ectopics. Um, and the list is now up to 58 with my group. Um, and out of those 58, I understand that it's not a very large number, 
um, and the plural of anecdote is not data, but um, really it's, um, we haven't seen any major complications with that. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, I also have a, a question for you that I think comes up a lot when I talk about this is, how do you counsel patients about their future pregnancies? I mean, there can be a lot of heroic surgeries for someone that really doesn't want another pregnancy. So um, how do you approach the, the subject pre-op and post-op in terms of these uh, complicated surgeries? That's an excellent question. And I, I have, uh, Dr. Tony, do you want to go first or I can go first? No, you go ahead. Okay, I think that's a great question, Dr. Bernhardt. Um, it, it depends on what kind of an ectopic pregnancy we're talking about. If it's a coronal ectopic pregnancy, uh, like Dr. Talandi mentioned, in my opinion, the risk of subsequent uterine rupture is very, very high. Uh, and we do talk about those issues, especially with coronal resection. Um, and with my maternal fetal medicine group, I think we've combined and decided that those patients might be served best by elective cesarean deliveries, much like we deal with patients with a classical cesarean um, incision. Whereas with cervical ectopic pregnancies, um, usually um, I've only seen one patient with a recurrent cervical ectopic pregnancy. Um, there are some um, reports about cervical ectopic pregnancy, especially with patients, recurrent cervical ectopics, where patients have had bilateral salpingectomies. So again, going back to the theory of there is some issue with implantation within the endometrium and the embryo is trying to hang on to any area that where it can implant. And so it, it doesn't, the counseling does include all of those things. And especially with recurrent ectopic pregnancies, um, I go in with a different sort of lens with, with, uh, of investigation there and talk to patients about those risks um, of if you've had a previous ectopic and we are seeing a second one, there has to be some issue with endometrial implantation too, and potentially, to, uh, you know, depending on what their plans are, if they want to start their family, um, you know, even as something as aggressive as we've had a patient with three cervical ectopics in a row, and she went on to gestational carrier. So I think it's a very individualized sort of counseling depending on their history, what ectopic pregnancy it is, and if it's a first or a recurrent ectopic pregnancy. Well, I think it's uh, like interstitial or cesarean call pregnancy or anything else. I think like we counsel the patient, um, there is a risk of another ectopic pregnancy. I think that's number one. After cesarean call pregnancy, if she gets pregnant again, it's clear that uh, she has to be followed and she needs another cesarean. Uh, it's clear for interstitial pregnancy, uh, again, I think we have to follow the patient up uh, after coronary resection, especially. We have to warn the obstetrician, and she, because she might have ruptured, she might rupture the, the pregnancy, and before and she has to be booked for repeat cesarean uh, for cesarean. Sorry. Um, I'm often asked. If somebody has an undesired pregnancy or an, an accidental pregnancy, and it's one of these unusual ectopics, would a hysterectomy be any more difficult given these circumstances? Or could, if that was a patient's desire, the surgery be done relatively simply? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's I don't think it's a big deal um, to, do, to do hysterectomy with this cervical pregnancy because if you're, you're removing the, the organs anyway question is whether we should do it. I mean, maybe not. Um, I, I agree. I mean, I think if it's a cervical um, ectopic pregnancy that's early gestation, I mean, I personally try to avoid a hysterectomy in the setting of a pregnancy as there are, uh, is a higher uh, risk of bleeding. Um, and I ideally would want to complete the hysterectomies minimally in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, I think, again, that would be very case-by-case um, case based in how far advanced the ectopic pregnancy is. Uh, but my uh, ideal choice would be to deal with uh, and, and treat the ectopic pregnancy first and then subsequently go into um, an, a, you know, a hysterectomy. And again, uh, one can also argue in saying that you know, in the setting of having an ectopic pregnancy, um, you know, one may not have that chance to think about irreversible uh, decisions like moving forward to a hysterectomy as well. So I think it, it may help to give the patient some time and deal with acute issue first 
uh, and then move on to the permanent uh, surgery later if desired. Okay, there's a question from the audience that was wanted to ask you, Dr. Khan, that said, um, you mentioned, we talked briefly about local injection. The question is, if there is no heartbeat, is there a rationale or a need for local injection? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and, you know, when we look at the literature and uh, the, the way uh, the literature is written is typically if there's a heartbeat, that in itself signifies that it's an advanced gestation. So um, I think of local injection as moving to the next step. So systemic methotrexate as being the least sort of uh, aggressive local injection and then surgery being the most aggressive. Um, but local injections, are I think for cesarean, early, very early cesarean scar ectopic pregnancies, um, I have given systemic methotrexate and have been successful in that. Um, but there's something about a cervical ectopic pregnancy. I feel like if one has sat through one or two of those um, uh, episodes of bleeding, um, you almost get a little bit of a PTSD from that and you want to avoid that at all costs. They're very, very high risk. And for cervical um, ectopic pregnancies, in, in my practice, I've only um, uh, resorted to local injection. Uh, but I know that there's no data um, proving that one way is better than the other. So it ends up being more of a, um, a surgeon's or a physician's choice and circumstances individualized to the patient. Okay. While I'm sifting through some of these other questions, I have a philosophical question for you. You, you talked about cesarean scar topic pregnancies, Dr. Tolundi. Is, that, is there something unusual or desirable about the cesarean section uh, scar that an embryo gets stuck or implants, or is this just a, a finite low number of certain embryos are just going to implant there if enough people get pregnant? Well, I think the people have described this, the, like the ethmosil or cesarean scar defect, or adenomyosis. The sperm might go on, might go there and meet this, the, the oocyte for some reason, and pregnancy occurs there. Um, the, I think for cesarean scar, the same thing, like after instrumentation of the uterus, especially perforation or hysteroscopic resection and deep, um, there is a, a defect there. Uh, and that's why pregnancy can occur. Uh, whether the cesarean scar defect is associated with cesarean scar pregnancy remains unknown. Yeah, it's it's one of those questions I, I don't I don't quite understand the etiology. Just like I wanted to ask you, Dr. Khan, about the ovarian pregnancy. What is it about an IUD that makes an ovarian pregnancy high risk? I I, I, I get. You. Dr. Bernard, you're you're the expert here. Too. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it really is. Oh, and and actually, ovarian, even though it's not as rare as rudimentary horn and cervical ectopics, that's the the least I've seen is ovarian ectopics, and they're very very difficult to identify. Um, but um, you know, it's fascinating why it should be you know associated with an IUD, and I think that we don't have the answer in the literature whether it's a progestin loaded IUD or a copper IUD, you know? Um, it'd be interesting to see if there were any differences even between the two different types of IUDs um, there. Yeah, well, I, I just wanna state for everybody, again, all contraceptive methods decrease the risk of ectopic pregnancies because they decrease the risk of pregnancy. However, there, there might be the occasional unusual one that we, that we see because some contraceptives fail, not because I don't think there's anything unusual that an IUD is causing an ovarian cancer, but I mean, pregnancy. Um, there are a couple specific questions for you guys. Um, did, did somebody mention the dose you use for um, injection of methotrexate in a sac? Do you guys know off the top of your head? 50 milligrams. And Dr. Talendi say, uh, in his slides, I think said 50 to 75 milligrams. So I, I use 50. Okay, yes, and what, what kind of volume? Um, uh, in about uh, the 50 milligrams in about five to eight milli milliliters. Oh, I'm sorry, for this is for the injection into a sac, five to eight milliliters? Yes. Okay, good. All right, there was also a question about um, the sutures you used and uh, how many layers of closures when, you're, when you've done a, well, I guess I could extrapolate. It could be a, removing a rudimentary horn or, or a coronary section. I guess the question is when you repair the uterus, how many layers and what suture? Yeah, I, I personally use um, one to two layers, depending on how much bleeding there is um, and if there's communication or not. Um, you know, it, it's unlike a myomectomy where you're closing a very deep layer for a rudimentary horn excision, for example, the connection between the unicorn and uterus is actually very small. It's almost a stalk. 
Um, but for a corneal excision, for a resection, for example, there's a multi-layered closure and um, uh, typically three to four, depending on how advanced the pregnancy is as well. With these very early um, ectopic pregnancies, there's no room to do more than two layers sometimes. So it, again, it varies from how it, uh, for me at least, it varies from how advanced the gestation is, where the location, it is, what location it is in. Yeah, I, or, I think that makes sense. These, these are intraoperative decisions sometimes, then you have to do, to do the best you can. Um, there's another very specific question that I'd like to get your opinion on. They're asking, how do you um, differentiate uh, rudimentary horn pregnancy from a didelphus uterus? In other words, um, well, I guess, you know, when is one an ectopic and when is just a pregnancy in a, in a, in a uh, uterine anomaly? Yeah, so there's a criteria for uh, diagnosis of rudimentary horn pregnancies. Um, and typically with a didelphic uterus, you can follow the gestational sac down to the level of the cervical canal of the, of the didelphic uh, cervix. With a rudimentary horn, um, you actually, in the, in the sagittal plane, the cervical canal leading to the fundus is absolutely empty. And when you go into the axial plane, as, as, as was shown in the images, there's a small connection between the actual uterus and the rudimentary horn. The third criteria is the ectopic pregnancy has to be surrounded by myometrium so that you don't confuse an advanced tubal pregnancy with, say, a rudimentary horn. Okay. Can I make a comment on uh, uh, a uh, rudimentary horn pregnancy, Kurt? Of course. Yeah, so I think if, if somebody is pregnant in rudimentary horn, my preference is to remove that rudimentary horn because she might have another uh, pregnancy there and might rupture and you know well I guess everybody knows well rupture in second pregnancy is a disaster so I'll rather remove it surgically rather than giving methotrexate. Okay yeah that is my approach as well for rudimentary horn pregnancies. All right I, I'm, I'm going to pretend like I'm at the boards here you just removed a uterine horn pregnancy but the bleeding is not controlled. One of one of the uh, participants wants to know how do you actually control the heavy bleeding during laparoscopy? Suture it. I usually suture it, and if if the bleeding is uh, is oozing all over the place, I use uh, flow gel and just pack it there, and usually they stop bleeding. Yeah, and so and I when I do uh, advanced gestations for every a single surgical case would use vasopressin um, and then for advanced ones uh, i actually will use bulldog clamps for the uterine arteries and for ongoing bleeding that's not controlled um, we actually will trace out the interior branch of the anterior uh, of the internal iliac um, by violent stringing the obliterated hypogastric so we can uh, put a clip on it and see if that's controlled if not then we move forward to a laparotomy do either of you consider um, unilateral uterine artery ablation either prophylactically or intraoperatively? You mean intra, uh, uterine artery ligation? Uh, well, the question here was ablation, so I assume that that was a radiologic procedure they're talking about. So, oh, uh, uterine artery embolization, maybe. Right. Yeah, I think it's a, we have done it as unilateral embolization and um, with yeah. methotrexate in a patient with a high risk uh, surgical procedure, high risk surgery. And as so, I mentioned, in, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, please. And as I mentioned in my presentation, um, in our practice, we've typically used uterine artery embolization for persistent bleeding after, in, uh, after sac injection of a cervical ectopic pregnancy. Okay. And, and actually, uterine artery ligation, you may perform intraoperatively if necessary. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, there's another question about: um, Do you have a, a maximum HCG, and uh, that that factors into your decision making for either whether you approach it surgically or with methotrexate, or is it all just you look at each case individually? Well, I think for for cesarean scar pregnancy and also uh, in in uh, interstitial pregnancy. Uh, because if you're giving multi-dose methotrexate, I don't really care uh, how high is the ACG. Um, we have to make sure that there is no uh, heterotopic pregnancy, though, if it is high. But if, if we know for sure there is no intrauterine pregnancy, um, I will just give multi-dose. Multi and sometimes uh, for cesarean score pregnancy and also for 
intra-abdominal pregnancy, the beta ACG is high. So I don't have any cut off point. I agree. I think it's very individualized. Um, rudimentary horn pregnancies, for example, you're gonna, uh, you know, the ones, the one that I presented was at 13 weeks. That HCG was in hundreds of thousands, um, yeah. but mostly you'll see them in the 20, 22 week, where the HCG will be lower. Um, and likely, likewise, like for cervical ectopic pregnancies, um, you know, irrespective of the HCG, my first line would probably be intra-sac injection. But for rudimentary horn pregnancies, irrespective of the HCGs, my first line of action would be going directly to laparoscopy and excising that rudimentary horn with the pregnancy inside. Yeah, I think I think the lesson here is, is as you presented by both of you very well, is that these are very unusual and sometimes life-saving or, or uterine-saving procedures. And that some of the rules that we could grain into our, ingrained into our heads about contraindications are thrown out the window here. Um, you know, if if, uh, for example, the liver functions goes up a tiny bit, I would still give more methotrexate. I mean, that, that, you know, we don't want to, we want to, we want to solve this issue. And, and I agree that you approach each case individually, and um, there shouldn't be a threshold to, for contraindication for HCG level or size of pregnancy. You still have to take care of it. Um, and I think you both have said very nicely the answer is all of the above when it comes to what are your choices and how to approach these these things. Um, I, I think a nice way to, to end this is uh, we got a lot of questions about really surgical judgment. So I want to ask each of you to, to take two seconds, and this will essentially be the last question. How do you approach this complex decision making in your mind? Because you can't write an algorithm here. So when you look at a case, you know what makes you think I need methotrexate, or what is my surgical approach? What are you looking for in the patient, the ultrasound findings, the MRI that make you decide how to approach an unusual pregnancy like this? Go ahead. Why don't, we go, why don't we go to Dr. Khan first? Sure. Um, for me, um, I think it's just a, the biggest one is location of this unusual ectopic pregnancy. So for a cervical, my first line of action would almost always be sac injection, unless it's a very advanced pregnancy. Usually, fortunately, they don't present very advanced because they will present with symptoms before advancing to that stage. For rudimentary horn, it's almost always going to surgery first. Um, for coronal ectopics and C-section ectopics, um, in my practice, that's the one where I still have to decide whether to give methotrexate or to operate. Um, and again, that is based on an individual um, sort of patient by patient basis, how far advanced the gestation is, how reliable the patient is. Um, uh, I live in Minnesota, um, and, and so, you know, sometimes patients nearest hospital from us is six, seven hour drive. And so we have to take all those things into consideration. And like you very nicely said, Dr. Barnhart, that a lot of these things that have been ingrained in our minds for ectopic pregnancy, which is ectopic pregnancy, you give single dose methotrexate, check an ACG day four, day seven, go out the window when it comes to these very rare, unique presentations of ectopic pregnancies. And I think that's this is the perfect world where medical management uh, sort of interventional management, which is intra-sac injection and true surgery, surgical management, all are on the table and can be interchanged uh, quite a bit, depending on what type of ectopic it is, how far advanced it is, and what how stable the patient is. Yeah, I agree. Your, your surgical judgment and your overall judgment trumps what you find in a case report and in, in, in the literature. Um, but Dr. Tulandi, you had a case series with your Chinese colleague, and he had many different choices. So I'd love to hear your rationale of how you run through those those choices. Well, they, they are not my choices. I think. <laughs> In fact, uh, they did it. But I think my choice is, um, again, methotrexate for cesarean score pregnancy. And I do laparoscopy. I think methotrexate and laparoscopy. That's my choice. And of course, uh, we also have to consider uh, patient's desire whether she wants to get pregnant again or not. And like Dr. Kahn, uh, we have patients from, we call it up north, is the Inuit native Canadian. Um, they're far, very far. They have to take plane to go to Montreal. And those those patients, uh, we have to treat them surgically. We cannot get them metal trash and go home. There's no way. We, so we, we are more aggressive with these people, yeah. Because they cannot go home and be followed there, no way. So in this day and age of protocolized medicine, we're telling people they can't follow a protocol? <laughs> that is absolutely correct. <laughs> so, so clinical and surgical judgment still matters. Well, I've got two very good surgeons that, that taught me that. 
fortunately, is job security for us. <laughs> <laughs> Any final comments that you'd like to make to our, our wonderful audience that were asking us great questions and joined us online? Well, I think, you know, you ho I hope you learn that uh, it's not one thing fits all. We still have to use our clinical judgment, especially if you're dealing with uh, unusual ectopic pregnancy. And I just want to thank you all for your attention. Dr. Khan, you got the last word. And I echo Dr. Chalendi's thoughts and thank you, Dr. Bernhardt, and thank you to Dr. Goodman and ASRM and SRS for putting up this wonderful webinar. And I hope that the viewers have enjoyed and learned something today. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Good. Thank you to our panelists and attendees. You will receive a survey by email after the session. Your feedback helps us give you the most relevant your input helps us give you the most relevant content. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please watch your email for notification about future webinars. For any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at ASRM.org. This concludes the webinar.